Hey, poker people, it's Sky Matsuhashi, and this is the Smart Poker Study Podcast. In episode 137 last week, I concluded the Seabed's minimum effective dose when I discussed the shenanigans that your opponent could attempt when you Seabet. You know, those check raises, Seabet raises, floats, and slow playing. Oh my. Hey, poker people, we are in the throes of May, and what a time. Sunny days, cool and cloudless nights, uh, and pretty soon, of course, thousands of people playing poker in Vegas at the WSOP. I will be heading out there again for the Colossus this year. Third time's gonna be my time. Um, I will be out there starting on June 1st, and I'm going to plan a little meetup at some point. Maybe on the 2nd or the 3rd, and uh, and I might copy uh, Thinking Poker's lead and have a meetup at the bowling alley across the street from the Rio at the Gold Coast Casino. You know, some bowling, maybe some pitchers of beer, that kind of thing. Um, I will keep you informed, though. But if you are there, hit me up on Twitter or email or look for the dude that looks like me with some smart poker poker study gear on maybe a t-shirt or a hat polo shirt you know um i will bring some extra shirts some hats and maybe some patches too if you'd like to support the show as well i might be handing some of those out just come say hi anywho it is time for the poker so today is the start of poker's seventh minimum effective dose and that is poker math it's going to be four episodes total and this week i'm going to be talking about hot and cold equities I'll also take a little walk down math memory lane, and I'll play some mathematical snippets from prior episodes that relate to today's topic. So please visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links to all these various episodes I'll be referencing. You can go to the show notes at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod138. And while you're there, please sign up for the weekly boost for exclusive poker strategy direct to your inbox. Alrighty, it is time. Gambate. And now for our feature presentation. Let's start our stroll down math memory lane with some percentage form talk. Understanding the math behind percentage form and how to use it to assign and analyze ranges, it really is key in all the hand analysis you do off and on the felt, of course. You need to understand this stuff before we talk about combo counting, then ultimately hot and cold equities. This right here is a snippet from episode number 66, and that episode was called The Hand Reading Lab Part 2, Hand Reading and Percentage Form. So, percentage form helps to assign a preflop range. This is especially useful for online play, but with a little estimating, it can be useful for live play as well. If your online opponent has, for example, a raise first in stat of 20% in the cutoff, this means he plays 20% of hands, which is usually the strongest or top 20% of hands within a hand matrix. If you play live and you'd estimate a player is playing 4 out of every 10 hands in a certain spot, then he's playing 40% of hands, which of course is much wider. It's double the hands than that 20% range. So this is the starting range that you'd give your opponent preflop, based on uh, you know, either the stats presented to you or your estimate of how often a player will play this way. So we start with the percentage of hands they play, then assign a range using this along with our history, uh, our history with them and their actions pre-flop. So this use of the percentage form helps us to be more accurate, logical, and to be more technical players. This is what the HUD gives us, you know, the percentage of how often somebody does something, which corresponds to the range of cards they do it with. Without a HUD, we just need to make an estimate of their range, then we narrow their range street by street the same way we would with, uh, you know, when you're playing online. So for more accuracy using percentage form, we need to know what hands are included in different ranges. Is ace-king within a 5% range? Yepers, it sure is. But is Ace Ten suited within within that five percent range? Probably not. You know, due to due to its weakness. You know, that weak ten kicker. Um, but is that Ace Ten suited within a ten percent range? Sure. But is Ace Ten off suit? Once again, probably not in a ten percent range due to the weakness of the off suit nature of it. And this is key in using percentage form knowing what hands fall within the different percentage ranges. You can learn this through constant practice and thought about ranges and doing hand ranging practice away from the tables. With enough practice, it will become second nature to you. Ooh, 
that's some good mathematical stuff. Normally costs like a hundred bucks a gram, but I'm giving it to you today for free. <laughs> uh, anyway, so percentage form and understanding the hands that make up various percentages is closely related to combo counting. Here's a snippet from episode number 68 called The Hand Reading Lab Part 3, Flopzilla and Hand Reading. So the fourth way that Flopzilla has really benefited me is in counting and understanding combos. So I talk a lot about percentages and percentage form in poker. Well, that's well and good for someone like me who understands percentages and can quickly convert this to actual hands or, or a range of hands. But Flopzilla does something really cool and it displays ranges and statistics in combo form. For example, that 30% range consists of 281 combos once we remove the board, you know, the Jack-10-7 cards, and uh, our pocket aces. So this now hits the flop 53% of the time, which is 148 hands. And for lots of people, these hard numbers are easier for them to understand. If you think 53%, uh, maybe that's difficult. But for some people, 148 out of 281 combos, those hard numbers could be easier. So looking at analyses in combo form helps us to spot humongo frequency issues in our game. So let's say we get to the flop with a player. We see about 90 combos of hands that we have, but he check shoves and we only call his check shove with sets, you know, with a flopped set. Well, for any non-paired flop, there are only 9 combos of sets, which means we're calling 9 out of 90 combos that we see bet, or only 10% of the time, which means we fold 90% of the time. His check shove only needs to work maybe 50% or less, but it's working 90% of the time. He's printing money by shoving 100% of the time versus us in this spot. So finding and correcting these frequency issues can plug many holes in our game. Yep, combo counting is important for understanding just how many of a specific or a group of hands your opponent might have. Some combo counting basics real quick here for you. There are six combos of any pocket pair. There are four combos of all suited hands, like King Jack suited. And there are 12 combos of all non-suited hands, like King Jack off. <laughs> and four combos of King Jack suited and 12 combos of King Jack off means there's a total of 16 combos for all non-paired hands. So let's look at a combo counting example in relation to the board right here. Uh, let's say you're on the river and there's four to the straight on the board and your opponent bets full pot. You need to be right 33% of the time versus his full pot size bet. And if your opponent has a king for the king high straight, then he'll beat your lower end queen high straight, let's say. So the question is, how many kings does he have here? And let's just assume that because of the preflop action, we think that he only would have started with pocket kings ace-king and king-queen suited only. All the other kings would have folded pre-flop. So there are six combos of pocket kings, 16 combos of ace-king, and only four combos of king-queen suited. And you don't block any of these. Let's say you have the 9-8 for the queen high straight here, you know, the lower end. So you don't block any of his kings, so he has that full total of 26 combos that currently beat you. You need to compare this number, 26, to all the other combos of hands he could have gotten to this river with. So if the 26 combos is more than 33% of his range, you shouldn't call his river bet. And 33% here, it's the magic number, because that's the break-even percentage for you calling a pot-sized bet here. If it's a dollar in the pot, he bet a dollar, you have to call a dollar to win a total pot of $3.00. 1 divided by 3 is 33% break-even. You need to be right more than 33% of the time. Alrighty, so that's combo counting. Uh, before we get to hot and cold equity, we've got to talk about just equity in general and the previous discussions of percentage form and combo counting, it'll help here as well. The definition of equity, this is the percent of the pot that belongs to you. For example, if you have 50% equity, then you can expect to win half the pot. You can also think of equity as how often you can expect to win the hand right now. So, for example, let's say your preflop range is only pocket aces. You're a super tight player. You only have pocket aces. So that's, of course, only six combos. Um, and this has 85% equity versus a range made up entirely of Broadway cards and pocket tens or better, which that's actually 153 combos. You have 85% equity versus it. But let's say the flop comes out 
crazy ugly for you of its, its King Queen Jack Rainbow. The Aces equity drops down big time from 85% down to 55%. Because remember, our opponent's combos, 153 of them, it's all Broadway hands and pocket pairs, tens or better. They smack this flop pretty darn hard. You do have an overpair with a gut shot draw, so that's why you're not below 50% here. But, you know, your pocket ace is a huge favorite pre-flop, now changed to not a huge favorite, just a regular favorite on the flop. So you can expect now to win 55% of the time. So this means that equities can change with every single card dealt. They don't always stay the same from start to finish, of course. And this takes us directly into hot and cold equities. So hot and cold equity, the definition is it's the equity of your hand or range right now, given no more action, and you're all in. It's the equity you consider when you're short stacked and somebody shoves and you have a decision whether or not to call all in. Once you call, there's no further action and you're getting to showdown no matter what. That's what hot and cold equity is. If you don't know how to calculate equities, all you need is an equity calculator like Flopzilla or Equilab. And all you have to do really is spend two minutes with any type of equity calculator and you'll begin your understanding of equities. So, Getting back to just hot and cold equity, it's really good for turning situations. You know, for example, I have King Queen suited. He's shoving 13 big blinds with a 20% range. So my hand has 52% equity versus him. I got to call here. The problem here is when we use hot and cold equity at the wrong time. And here are just two instances. Instance number one, we're in the big blind with Jack eight offsuit. Our aggressive opponent opens to two and a half big blinds with a 15% range, rather tight range. We have to call 1.5 big blinds, which means we only need 28% equity. And there are full 100 big blind stacks behind us both, so we can expect lots of post-flop action. Our hot and cold equity versus this range is 35%, you know, the jack-8 offsuit versus a 15% range. And uh, it's 35%, so since we only need 28%, we decide to call. And I've got to say, before I go on to the next situation, uh, this is a bad call. Sure, you have the requisite equity, the requisite hot and cold equity, but how likely are you going to make money in this spot? You're the preflop caller with jack-8 offsuit, out of position on the flop, and up against an aggressive opponent. You won't necessarily like a jack or an 8 on the flop. You might flop and open in a straight draw, but now you'll have to pay more to catch that draw on the turn or the river. And you can't even flop a flush draw because you're jack-8 offsuit. Um... I mean, you can if it's a monotone, but that hop in happens very rarely. Your opponent probably won't let you see a free turn card. So you're calling right now preflop with a very weak hand, and you can expect to fork even more money into the pot, um, you know, post-flop. So this is not a bread and butter situation. You should not be making this call. So situation number two, the same hand as the previous. We have that jack-8 offsuit. We decided to call, so we're out of position on the flop. Flop comes down Ace, 10, 9. Our opponent is a double barreler by looking at his stats. Maybe he has a flop seabed at 70% and a turn seabed at 65%. We flopped the open-ended straight draw for 16% hot and cold equity right now to hit our straight on the turn. And our opponent only bets 40% of the pot. By the way, I'll talk about outs and odds after the break, you know. Like I just said, we have 16% hot and cold equity, but we'll get to that later on. Looking at the equity of our call. Calling a 40% pot size bet means we need to have 22% equity to profitably call. We're so close that we decide to make the call even though we're not getting exactly the right price. Like I said, we have 16% chance of hitting our straight on the turn, but we're being offered 22%. Just not really worth it right there. It's an unprofitable call. So once again, this is a mistake. We're playing passively and just hoping to hit a hand. If we had check raised, at least we'd have some fold equity on our side. And I'll talk about fold equity in a later math episode here. Um, we're not getting the right price, and we can expect a double barrel on this ace-high flop. We're paying now, and we can expect to pay even more on the turn. We've gone from bad to worse in this hand. Forked over money pre-flop that we shouldn't have. Forked over money on the flop that we shouldn't have. And then now we're likely getting to the turn, not going to hit, and possibly have to uh, and have to pay even more. It's not a bread-and-butter situation like I men mentioned previously. 
So because there's more action expected, we can't really just base our decisions on hot and cold equity. We need to consider more than just this. And the two situations I just mentioned, uh, like I said, they're not bread and butter situations. Bread and butter means this is the best spot to be in that we're most likely to realize some profit in this hand. So what makes a bread and butter situation? It's having the three advantages of poker. And let me play a snippet from episode number 125, called Plug Your Leaks Number 1, Playing Weak Hands Out of Position. So in pre-flop poker, there's three considerations before you get involved in any hand. And I'll go over each of these individually, but first, all three. Number one is card advantage. Number two is skill advantage. And number three is positional advantage. So for number one, card advantage... If your hand is strong enough, it doesn't matter if you're in position or out of position. You're going to enter the pot no matter what. You specifically gave the example of queen-10 suited, and generally a hand like this is pretty weak. You're dominated by just about any 10 that will call, and a lot of queens that will call have you dominated as well. That's not to say this is a bad hand to play, but you just need to be aware of the inherent vulnerabilities of the hand that you choose. The second thing that we need to consider before we play a hand preflop is skill advantage. You need to consider the skill advantage you have over the other players you're likely to see the flop with. So if you're under the gun, you've got up to eight other players who can call your open raise, and six of them will be calling in position on you. That's a lot of guys that can make your life very difficult. So before you make your play, you need to think about which players are going to call you. Look at those remaining eight players and just think about their player types, how loose, how passive, how aggressive they might be, and just consider if I open to three big blinds here, who's going to call? So beyond the skill advantage, the third thing you need to consider before you get involved in a hand is positional advantage. And of course, everybody knows it's way easier to play in position. And there's a reason why the button is the most valuable spot on the table. It's like in real estate. They say location, location, location. Well, in poker, you should be saying position, position, position. If we had thought about the three advantages pre-flop before we called in the big blind with our jack-8 offsuit, we would have realized the following. We do not have card advantage. Guaranteed, every card in our 15% openers range, he has, um, or every single one of those cards that he has, is 100% stronger than our jack-8 offsuit. And it's very likely that we don't have skill advantage. It's possible we do. But he's aggressive, and it's tough to out-aggress a double-barreling player post-flop. If we're going to rely on our skill, then we need to realize that it might take our full 100 big blind stack to push him off at some point, and that risk shouldn't be taken with Jack-8 offsuit. And thirdly, of course, we definitely do not have positional advantage. And that's too bad, because being in position makes bluffing easy, uh, or easier, pot controlling easier, and it's easier to get value when we flop the miracle trips or a miracle straight. So make sure you consider the three advantages pre-flop before you call with mediocre hands, just because the price is right. On Saturday, May 27th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'll be holding my next premium webinar. It's going to be a joint production between me and Mark from ExceptionalPoker.com. You remember him. He's the guy that created that killer fold equity slash pot equity grid from last week's podcast about C-bets. Uh, he knows his stuff, and we're teaming up for a webinar called Poker Mathematics. If you want more math goodness, this is the one for you. We'll be deep diving into the most important math and showing you how to practice it off the tables and how to use it on the tables. To learn more and to sign up, please visit www.smartpokerstudy.com slash mathwebinar. There is a 30% discount if you purchase the webinar prior to Monday the 22nd at midnight. Just use offer code EARLYBIRD. So don't miss out. And you can find my book, How to Study Poker Volume 1, in every format on Amazon.com. I've got ebook, I've got paperback, I've got audiobook. Please leave an honest review and send it to me. I really want to read it on the air and give you a little shout out by name for supporting the show. Your reviews really do help spread the word. Alrighty, back to class, poker people. So in that prior example of flopping the open in a straight draw and needing 22% equity to make a profitable call, you might have been asking yourself, how do we calculate that? Um, I discuss just that within this snippet here from Q&A episode number 106 about pot odds. So when it comes to understanding pot odds, you've really just got to drill the math into your head. It's all about repetition over and over every day. 
every session, every hand you play, and every hand you review. So when you are facing a bet um, or making a bet, run the math through your head. You should be thinking something like, he bet three big blinds into the four big blind pot. That means I need to call three to win 10 big blinds total. So three divided by 10 means I need 30% equity. If you want to look at this in terms of an odds ratio, you're being offered odds of 7 to 3. You have to call 3 to win the current pot of 7. This means your 3 big blind call will win a total pot of 10 big blinds after your call is added in, of course. So once again, your 3 big blind call divided by the 10 big blind total pot means you need to have 30% equity. You can do this with any size pot and any size bet, of course. Let's say the pot is uh, $2 and your opponent bet 2 bucks. Now, the pot ends up being $4 and you have to call $2. So you're being offered odds of 4 to 2, and this simplifies down to 2 to 1, of course. So this means your $2 call will win a total pot of $6, so you need 33% equity. And another way to look at this is that calling the full pot size bet means you need 33% equity. So when I mentioned in that snippet right there about drilling the math in your head, you do this off the felt during hand history review sessions. I recommend that you look at a series of 25 hands every day for one full week. Your goal in these 25 hands is to practice your pot odds understanding. It doesn't matter if you're involved in the hand or not. So here are some questions to ask yourself with each hand that will help drill these numbers in your noggin. Question number one, nobody's called yet. So what are the pot odds for limping? Or, question number two, a player opened to three big blinds. What are the pot odds for calling that? Or question number three, I opened. He three bet me to nine big blinds. What are the pot odds for calling his three bet? And I recommend that you write all these down to help you memorize these pot odds calculations. So if we talk about pot odds, we've got to talk about your outs as well. In that prior jack eight offsuit hand, we had eight outs to the straight. And I said that we've got a 16% chance of hitting on the turn. But how do we know this is the case? We follow the times two rule. We can multiply our outs by two to estimate our chances of hitting one of those outs on the next street. And in case you don't believe me or you want a little backup, here's the math behind the times two rule with eight outs. So a full deck of cards contains 52 cards. We've seen our two cards and three cards on the board for a total of five cards. That leaves 47 cards still in the deck that we don't know about. Of those 47, 8 cards make our hand. So on the next street, our odds of being dealt one of those 8 cards is 8 divided by 47, or 17%, which is super close to our estimated 16% using the times 2 rule. And once you know the rule, you don't actually have to run this exact math because the times 2 rule is always close enough to base your decision on. For some people, though, uh, the tough part is counting their outs. It can take practice to know your outs, to see the board, to see your hand, and figure out how many outs you have to make a solid hand. And so in episode number 55, I gave you a simple way to practice your outs counting. So for outs practice, if you do what I'm about to suggest, you'll get some great practice in reading boards and considering what future cards can add to your equity in the hand. So grab a deck of cards and deal out a random flop. Look at the flop and determine three different drawing hands that could hit that flop. For example, the flop is Jack, 10, Deuce, Rainbow. A good draw is the Gut Shot plus Overs, so that's like the Ace, Queen, or the Ace, King, and those both have 10 outs for top pair or better. Another good draw is the Open and a Straight draw, and that's 8, 9, or a King, Queen for 8 outs each. And a weaker draw is a Gut Shot, which is like the King, 9, or the Queen, 8, or the 7, 8 for 4 outs each. Alrighty, we're back, and for the final stroll down math memory lane, we've talked practicing your odds understanding, we've talked practicing your outs understanding, now let's combine them, and in this snippet from episode number 130, I do just that. And uh, let's do some math right here. Regarding equity and pot odds, uh, comparing the two is how you decide whether or not it's a profitable call. You can't just look at it and say, oh, he bet half pot. It's worth calling. I'm on a draw. I'll do it. That's not good enough. I mean, just the size of the bet doesn't, doesn't matter in itself. You need to compare that with the equity that you have in the hand. So we can look at this with two different situations. Let's say, number one, 
you have an open and a straight draw plus a flush draw for 15 total outs. Now, 15 outs is 30% equity in the pot, you know, using the times two rule for drawing hands, which I talked about back in episode 111. Um, if your opponent bets half pot, you need at least 25% equity to make a profitable call. And remember, the break-even math on that is your call divided by the total pot after your call. So, uh, half pot bets, you need a call and have 25% equity. Well, you have at least that here with your 15 outs and 30% equity, but If you only had a flush draw for 9 outs, then you only have 18% equity, so you shouldn't make the call. So having less outs makes your call unprofitable here, with this bet sizing you're facing. And a second situation. Let's say you've got top pair on the river, and your opponent bets $30 into $50. Your $30 call is trying to win a total pot of $110. So you need about 28% equity, you know, 30 divided by 110. Maybe you think that you only beat 25% of his range. Well, then you can kind of equate that to equity. That means you have 25% equity in this hand. You need 28 to call, so it's not a profitable call. But let's say that you beat him half the time. If it's a 50-50 instance and you only need 28% equity, great, then make the call. That's how you should use pot odds coupled with your outs and equity in the hand, Greg. I hope this helps and good luck. Alrighty, it might not seem like a lot of fun, but learning all of this poker math is super important. So please, all those steps that I said for practicing outs and practicing odds and stuff, get to work on that. So, challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Practice that math! As you run your 25 hand reviews this week, have a calculator and an equity program open and calculate the following things with every hand dealt, every bet made, and every card turned over. Calculate the preflop ranges in percentage form for you and your opponent. Calculate the number of combos in your ranges. Calculate the preflop hot and cold equities. Calculate the pot odds the current bet is offering the caller. And calculate the number of outs on the flop and the odds of hitting on the next street. Your goal with these exercises is to up your poker math familiarity to improve your in-game decision making. Now it's your turn to take action and do something positive for your poker game. Now get it on. So this episode isn't complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod138. Go there for screenshots and links to everything, all the different snippets that I discussed today. They're all waiting right there for you. And I want to give a great thanks to two super cute poker peeps today. Number one is Richard Thompson. He decided to support me on Patreon with a monthly contribution to me. Thank you so much, Richard. I really do appreciate it. I'm sure you'll get a ton out of all the bonus content that I give to my Patreon subscribers. Thank you. You demand, Richard. And uh, also, I received a book review from David Ustuizen. Uh, and actually, it was a it was an audiobook review. My first audiobook review. And let me read it to you. This book will improve your profitability. I have read many, many poker books. I've often gotten a few tips and tricks and usually improved my game slightly. But most of the common poker books are limited in their scope. Sky's approach offers a lot more. Sky gives the tools that enable one to continuously improve their poker game. And he he says, my second favorite book... Poker book is the mental game of poker. Oh, good. This book and Sky's podcast have allowed me to improve my profitability massively. I have gone from being a losing player to a winning player. I have played 40,000 hands since studying with Sky's technique. I am now winning over five big blinds per 100 hands. And the previous 40,000 hands were negative 20 big blinds. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. I really do appreciate it. That is so awesome of you. Um, so everybody else, if you've purchased the book, please leave me a review like David here. If you'd like, follow Richard Thompson's lead. I would love that to support me on Patreon as well so I can keep on keeping on. Thank you so much for listening today. Alrighty, if you can type the words Smart Poker Study, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube. Or send an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com. 
Alrighty, Poker Peeps, next week in episode 139, I will have a special interview for you. It's an interview with Dr. Tricia Cardner. I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm sure she's going to drop some mega value bombs on all of us. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet. I want to fly as hell, I want the walls to melt, cause I got to lose myself tonight. Yeah, I got to let it all go tonight, so turn it up.